Turning your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Looking at verses 28 through 34, the overarching theme of this gospel is the gospel in action because that's what it is. Mark uses the language and, and charts the course from the very beginning for Jesus to get to the cross, and we are close to that marvelous event. Verses 28 to 34, thinking today about this, the most important commandment, or the, the first commandment. That was most, pro most prominence. If you have your Bibles, I hope you found Mark chapter 12, verses 20 to 34. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen for you. would like for you to have your own Bible, however. Stand with me if you would while I read this passage from God's Word. Follow along in the text. <clears throat> and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. That's the, that's the previous encounter we talked about last week. Seeing that he answered them well asked, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and that there is no other, God, no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Public inquiry has ceased at this point. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to see what Jesus was teaching here today, apply it first to our hearts, and then understand how we can apply this to the world in which we live, which desperately needs an answer to its lawlessness. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, the previous questions asked that we've, we've read through, looked at, were asked to trip him or to expose him or to, to humiliate him or humble him, to, to call him out, to denigrate him. They, were all, they all had a, a, a motive that was evil. I don't know that we can put this question in that category. This scribe seemed, uh, if he was following the same agenda as the others, he doesn't show it, he doesn't expose it. In fact, he, he says something that none of the others would dare allow to come out of their mouths. You are right, teacher. None of the others give Jesus that credit. It's important to know as we look into this that Jesus answers his question about the commandments with a response from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 19. The, the, we're going to see in a moment the chapter 6 portion is what's called the Shema. We'll tell you why that's called that in a moment. In chapter 19 of Leviticus is called the Holiness Code. There were 613 commandments that the Jews recognized in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments, as I taught you when we went through this several years ago, is, is what we call the, the moral law, a summary of the moral law. Law of God in the Old Testament is divided into three categories. The sacri sac sacrificial or ceremonial law, which all foreshadowed the coming of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice. The judicial law, which, which kept was designed to keep uh, Israel relatively, ethnically, Pure. They had, they had responsibilities and commandments, uh, things that were forbidden, things that were, were uh, enjoined upon them that would keep them ethnically pure from other societies, not because God is a bigot, but because Messiah was coming from the Jews and the Lord intended for the Jews to be a distinct people, a recognizable people, not an amalgamation of others. But there was the moral law. The ceremonial law was fulfilled when Christ came. He, uh, he is the law walking. 
The judicial law was fulfilled when, when, when the new covenant was, was entered into, when Jesus ushered in the new covenant. We talk about that every month when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The moral law, however, continues in what the old scholars call perpetuity. It, it continues because it speaks of the character of God reflected in the life of Christ and the expectations God has for his people. We are delivered from the law as saints, as when, we're, when we come to know Christ, we're delivered from the law as an instrument of condemnation. The law no longer condemns us, but it becomes for us a guide, a, what's called a rule of life for the believer. And I would say that it is the loss of this sense of moral law that has thrown our society into chaos. Now, growing up thinking that you can keep the commandments is as deadly as ignoring them. One produces a legalistic Pharisee, the other produce, produces a licentious antinomian, a libertine. There's a path, an evangelical path, though. And so it's interesting to me as we, as we delve into this that Jesus, what he does say and what he does not say. When the man approached him, Jesus did not say, now wait a minute, why are you talking about commandments? I'm here. No, the one who fulfilled the commandments teaches us something about them the commandments to be good for us to know today. I want you to see this passage. It's going to pack it under five headings, okay? First, there's this question about the most important commandment. Uh, then second, there's the unexpected answer from Jesus. Third, an unexpected response from the scribe. Fourth, a hopeful observation from Jesus. And then finally, Jesus' critics withdraw from the public arena. He silences them at least in their conversation to him. They'll continue having conversations about him. He just won't be a part of it. Look at this question about the most important commandment. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And we can guess that that's either the Sadducees are fussing among themselves as to why, why the question wasn't better posed or how did you let him get away like that? Or maybe the Sadducees are fussing with the disciples. We don't know, but they're, they're fussing with one another. And seeing that he, that is Jesus, answered them well, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Which is the, which is the first? Which is the chief? Which, if you have to lay them all out, which one is the most important? Now, interestingly enough, in, the, in something, a document called the Babylonian Talmud, there's an inscription it says this. This is, not, this is not an unusual question necessarily. On another occasion it happened that a certain heathen, this, reading from the Talmud here, came before Shammai. Remember there were two primary schools of, of uh, teaching in, in Judaism, that of Shammai and that of Hillel. We've talked about that before. So he came before Shammai and said to him, Make me a proselyte on condition that you teach me the whole Torah, the whole law, while I stand on one foot. What's he saying there? He's saying, Convince me to be a follower, summing up the law in the time it, that I can stand on one foot. Well, Shammai was repulsed by what he suggested, and he threw what's called a builder's cubit at him, which he's holding in his hand. <laughs> in other words, get out of here. So he went to Hillel and said to him the same thing. And here's Hillel's answer. What is hateful to you, do not to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah, the whole law. Now the rest is commentary thereof. Go and learn it. So you see what the answer was, even among Judaism. Treat your neighbor as you want to be treated. That reminds you of something. The golden rule. As you would, as others would do unto you, do you even so to them. So that was functioning in Judaism. Now I point that out so you know that this is... Uh, Jesus is not making this up, coming up with something new. In fact, you're going to see here in a moment uh, that he gets this same answer when he asks a question in another section in, Luke, in Luke's gospel. So there's this positing of the question, which 
commandment is the most important. Now, you should know that if you're a good Jew and you pick one of the Ten Commandments over the other, you have necessarily denigrated the Ten Commandments, the other nine. You say they're less important. And Jesus, all wise, all knowing, understanding, uh, in fact, we've, we've looked at this before, if, if the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God, and we know that God is a spirit and has not a body like man, the only time God has a finger is in the person of Jesus Christ. And we've, we've I'll do a little rabbit trail here. We've studied historically, and in the past, these theophanies that, that show up in Jesus, the second person of the Trinity showing up in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the theophany of God, theos, phaneo, simply meaning God taking a, phaneo, taking a face. So Jesus is not simply answering something about the law. Jesus is the author of the law. Second thing you need to see is this, this answer that he gives was probably unexpected by the scribe. And I still think that there are other religious leaders standing around. And we'll show you why the text addresses that. Jesus answered in verse 29, The most important is hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Look at me at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and turn in your Bibles to Leviticus 19, 18, and hold that place for a moment. There's no new word that Jesus gives. This passage of Scripture, if you're familiar with it, is called the Shema. And the, and the reason it's called that is the, the first word in the Hebrew in, the, in verse uh, four of chapter six of Deuteronomy is the word Shema. It's, it's the call to Israel to recognize that God is one. They, they are monotheists. They did not worship a multiplicity of gods like the rest of the nations around them at the time did. And this one God deserves and demands our total devotion. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. There's the, that, that center of emotion. With all your soul, your, 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 etern, your eternalness. With all your mind, your capacity of thinking and communicating, and with all your strength, your energies are to be devoted. This is and if you remember the Shema, it goes on to say to the parents, and these things you shall teach unto your children. You shall bind them as, as uh, over your doors. You shall bind them on your wrists. And when your children rise up, you shall teach them these things. When they walk in the way, you shall teach them these things. When they lie down, you shall teach them these things. That's what the rest of the passage says. That the children of Israel were to have burned upon their consciences that they served one true and living God and not be fascinated or lured by the societies around them that they would be passing through as they were on their way to Canaan. It set them apart. And today, the great religions of the world. One God. Judaism believes in one God. They don't read the whole story. They don't read the New Testament, which tells us this one God revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Islam, with all of its ugliness, affirms one God. Christianity, however, affirms the oneness of God in three as he's revealed himself. The oneness of God in three persons. And so the generations were to be raised understanding that the greatness of God, the holiness of God, the holy otherness of God demands total and complete devotion to him. 
Now folks, I don't know about you. That's daunting. How can we do that? Have I ever loved God with all of my heart? Have I ever loved Him with all of my soul, that, that part of me that, that will that exist eternally? With all of my mind, my, my thoughts, totally captivated by and always set upon, and with all of my energies, how can we do that? We, we should feel the press of that. As Israel should have felt the press of that. Cried out, Lord, help. And then recognize that God sent help. Jesus Christ, who perfectly loved God his Father with all of his heart. Who loved him with all of his soul. Who loved him with all of his mind. Who loved him with every ounce of his strength. You see, this is taught to press us to seek one outside of ourselves. And so the Shema, Jesus cites that, but he's, but he's going to give the scribe more than he asked. You're going to see in a minute the significance of this. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. In other words, the answer to the scribe is there's not one, but two. Look at Leviticus 19.18. Part of the holiness code. If you read through the 19th chapter of Leviticus, it's teaching, teaching about a standard of conduct. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, to appreciate what's going on here, we just we read responsively the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were given on tablets of stone, two of them. Philo, a contemporary of Jesus who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, observed that the Ten Commandments contained five dealing with responsibilities toward God, or piety, and five dealing with responsibilities toward other people, or, or justice. If you look at the two tablets of stone, the first five commandments, no other God, no graven image, don't take his name in vain, remember his day, honor father and mother, father and mother, the fifth commandment has been considered a bridge commandment, because it does speak of a God as ultimately our father, but also as those in authority over us, so it's, it's a person's relationship to God, it's that, it's that vertical relationship that we're to have to God, all those speak to that. The sixth commandment, you shall not kill. The seventh, you shall not commit adultery. The eighth, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Nine, and tenth, you shall not covet. Those are all about relationship to one another, to fellow man. And, and if you can visualize this, the, the vertical, the first tablet speaks vertically, our relationship to God, or piety, as Philo said. The second tablet speaks of our relationship to our fellow man horizontally, or that of, of justice, we hear a lot about justice today, don't we? Social justice, social justice. It's a buzzword. You cannot, in the name of social justice, kill innocent people. It really betrays that you don't understand the first thing about social justice. Here is justice relating to our fellow man. And there's a cross form. That's what I want you to see. Vertically, our relationship to God. Horizontally, our relationship to one another. And the only way you can accomplish that is in the cross. The only way. And I said to you that Jesus wasn't making this up, being clever, showing off. Look at Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, the lawyer, answered, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Now that's, that's the fly in the omen, isn't it? Do this, and you will live. That's what the law demands. The Puritans had a, a clever saying, do this and live, the law demands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. A sweeter sound the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. You see, we are commanded to do this. How sinful are sinners? So sinful that if on our own we do not love God with all of our being and love our neighbor as ourselves, do that perfectly, then we die the death. We are under condemnation. And only in Jesus Christ can you, what we would call an evangelical embrace of the law. As you live recognizing God's standard, but also appreciating that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the standard. And it's in Him, by grace through faith in Him, that we are counted as righteous before God. So it says in verse 20, But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And if you know this passage of Scripture, you know what followed. It's the story that we call the story of the Good Samaritan. And the story Jesus told him, we, we catechize our children, now our grandchildren, And who is your neighbor, we ask? All my fellow men are my neighbors. All my fellow men are my neighbors. The only people who are your neighbors are the ones that you have this in common with. That you trace your lineage back to Adam. Nobody else is in the category of your neighbors. Only those who trace lineage back to Adam. He is made of one blood, Acts 17 says, of all mankind. All tracing back to Adam. You see, folks, this is part of the problem we deal with today. We have, we have not taken seriously love for God. Loving Him through Jesus Christ, through the blood, because you can't, you can't love Him any other way. You come to, come to God any other way, try to love Him on your terms, and you are condemned to hell because you will not love Him at the standard He demands that He be loved. But if you love Him through Jesus Christ, because, because you recognize God's love for us, and you embrace God by grace through faith in Christ, then He counts that as righteous. He says, yes, you, you do love me. We love your neighbors, and we haven't loved our neighbors well. I, mean, I grew up in the, in the race riots of the 60s, forced integration. It was, it was ugly. And I've told you this before, and I just want to remind you today. The, quote, evangelical church I grew up in set in motion a plan when it was announced that the that the, the black people in our community were going to be attending our churches, the whole integration mindset. And they set in motion a plan to be sure that they would block any black people at the door, that they would not let them in. They, they assigned men who, to my knowledge, hadn't lifted a finger to serve the church of Jesus Christ or serve that community. Somehow they were willing to be the, the bodyguard standing at the door blocking the way for people of color to come in to our facility. You see, in that day, when, when the church of Jesus Christ, red, yellow, brown, black, white, should have come together and joined hands and said, we will show you the more excellent way. The tragedy is that in too many places, the white church in the South stood in the door. They were the chief promoters of bigotry. And we're reaping a whirlwind for it today. And it's come to us today. And now we have our time. And we must be a people who join hands, who believe it when we sing, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They're precious in His sight. We've got to do that. 
Who's my neighbor? People who are not like me are my neighbors. We get too comfortable being with people that are like us or that like us. And the way forward here is for the church of Jesus Christ to join hands. And you need to know, if you haven't heard this, the pastors in this city, many of the pastors, we gather weekly and we pray. And we're praying that God will use the churches in our area to start a revival, not, not of race reconciliation, but of reconciliation in Christ. That we will, we will live as Jesus Christ before a watching world. That we will, we will love others as Christ would have us love them when they're not lovely. That, that we would offer the gospel. That the greatest gift we can give to anyone is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that he died for sinners. But you see, folks, part of the problem is nobody thinks they're a sinner anymore because the law has been taken out of the equation. Jesus gave his response. You see, God's will has always been the same. Love God in your totality and love others as you love yourself. Treat others the way you want to be treated. You know, I've, I've had to learn, and I say this to my shame, I've, I've had to learn and I saw this on the face of my African-American pastor friend a week ago Saturday. There was grief and fear in his face as he led us in a, in a prayer breakfast time together. And I thought, my soul, I don't experience that fear. I need to let that brother know I've got his back. I've got to bear that burden with him. I'm sure the same is true of our Hispanic brothers and sisters. They face things that you and I don't know anything about. And we've got to say we, we love you and we have your back. We are one in this. Stand up against lawlessness to be sure. But protect the vulnerable to be sure. Jesus showed us the way. It is to love God with the totality of our being and love one another as we would want to be loved. And a lot of barriers will fall if we take up that banner. You see, the scribe he responded, I think, I didn't expect this response from him, having read the previous encounters. The scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all, than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You see, the people Jesus had been having discussions with we're all about burnt offerings and sacrifices. We're all about religious ritual. We're all about religious duty. Read through the Gospels and see how Jesus chides them time and time again. We're going to look tonight a little bit at how he exposed that they were more concerned about traditions, their, their religious traditions, to protect the religious traditions than they were about compassion for the downtrodden, for the hurting the heartbroken. You see, this is not a new idea. Look at just two places real quickly. You can find this throughout the Old Testament. Look at Hosea 6, 6. The prophet speaking for God. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Then, of course, Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. Many of you know verse 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before God on high. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? 
Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, the question is, do I need to sacrifice these things in order to please God? The answer from the prophet, speaking on behalf of God, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, that is, practice justice. Stand up for justice and stand against any injustice, wherever we find it. Starting first in our own hearts. And to love kindness, that is to, to, to love to show mercy. And to walk humbly with God. If we're blessed by God, it should humble us, not make us proud prideful and Jesus heard this and saw that he answered wisely he said to him you're not far from the kingdom of God and what does he mean by that does he mean that, that the, man, the man recognizing the answer has so, somehow moved his position from dead in trespasses and sins to close no no, he's still dead in trespasses and sins. Until he embraces God's way, and that's Jesus Christ. You see, the kingdom of God focuses on love of God and love for others. That's what he means. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Mike, the kingdom I came to bring was a kingdom of people loving God and loving others as they themselves want to be loved. Folks, that's what the gospel does to us, for us, in us. Is it convinces us that God loves us and it stirs in us a, a heart that loves God. It's, it's deepening work is that as we love God, who should have condemned us, I deserved to go to hell. I deserved to go to hell. If I measured by my conduct. But God, who is rich in mercy, wherein He loved us in past times, sent Jesus Christ to die for sinners like me and like you. And if I remind myself that I deserve the pit of hell, then it's hard for me to get high and mighty. It's hard for me to look down at others. I think that's what Paul's getting after when he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of being repeated to all. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And I, the Apostle Paul, he doesn't say was the worst before. No, am the worst. It's that walking humbly with God. To know that the kingdom of God, when it comes, Jesus said, I've, I've come. The kingdom of God is among you with me being here. And we watch him. And what did he do? He loved God devotedly, intensely, entirely. And he loved others. He loved the people that the religious folks of the day had written off as unlovely and unworthy of their time and their energy. And Jesus reached out and loved them. And he incensed the religious elite of the day. And I think he did it intentionally to show them that they were missing the kingdom of God because they did not love God. You see, it becomes a measure of our love for God, the way we love others. And John gets after that, doesn't he, in 1 John? Don't tell me you love God if you hate your brother. Well, this encounter silenced his critics. Notice, after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. He spoke with authority, unequaled. He turned their nooses on them every time. But he showed us the way. I read at Norman Lee Ward's funeral this past Tuesday. It's the first time in 40 years of doing funerals that I've ever read this passage at a funeral. 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter. Typically we 
hear it read at weddings. I've read it at weddings. But Paul didn't write it to be read at a wedding. He didn't even write it to be read at a funeral necessarily. He wrote it to speak to a church that was in crisis. He said, here's the more excellent way to love. But what I thought about as I was preparing the message for Norma Lee's funeral was that, you know, we read this at weddings hoping, hoping that the young groom and the young bride will take this to heart and practice this in their lives and their relationships and love this, this way, love one another this way. But in Norma Lee's case, we could look back over a life of 85 years, a marriage of 64 years, and say, look how this marked her life. Why? Why? Because she loved God. And God loved her. And folks, this should mark our lives. And I'm grateful, by the way, for those here that it does mark your life. But oh, people, we've got to stand in the gap. There are folks who are not like us, who are hurting, who are scared. And we must show love. There are people doing awful things in the name of social justice, and we must stand for justice. We must take Jesus' summary of the moral law and know that I must be one who, who is marked out as loving God. It's going to cost us one day, I'm quite convinced. But I must be marked as one who loves others. Who loves others. Who loves my friends who loves my families, who loves the strangers, who loves my enemies. And folks, I've got a long way to go in loving my enemies, I'm going to tell you. i got a long way to go. I'm just being honest with you. And then Jesus calls us to that. And I believe if the church of Jesus Christ, 30, 40, 50 years from now, if Jesus tarries, folks are going to look back and write about this generation, write about this generation of the church of Jesus Christ. What did we do? Did we stand in the gap and move forward together, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, followers of Christ, and show the more excellent way. Love covers a multitude of sins. May God help us to take to heart what Jesus is teaching, to be like Jesus in this quickly darkening generation. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and thank you for your word. And oh, we pray your spirit would work into our lives increasingly and more expansively and, and more, more deepened this truth that we would love you with all of our being and where we find ourselves not doing that, Lord, that you would, you would by your spirit work in us and help us to thank you for Jesus Christ who who did love you that way, who does love you that way, who stood in our place and died for us so that when we, when we, by faith, don't love you that way, you accept us nonetheless. And help us to love one another, to love our neighbors the way we want to be loved. To hurt with those who hurt, to recognize the vulnerability of some around us and stand in the gap to cover their backs and protect them. And help us to be the answer. We know what the answer is, but help us to be the answer to what ails this wicked and perverse generation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand